Um, good evening. I am Linda Keene, Professor of Architecture and Environmental Design and a founding chair of architecture here at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Reading over uh, Jenny Sabin's um, CV tonight, it reminded me of when we had fine <laughs> debates about the future of architecture in an art school. And <clears throat> we shared readings with the artist, with the designers, with liberal arts, with art historians, and we came up with the meme of thinking and making. And at that time, <clears throat> the architects looked at what the artists were doing with all of their materials in sculpture and painting and drawing. And we invited George Bellarian, the founder of Material Connections, originally in New York and then other cities around the world, to bring a research center in materiality here. Um, things happened at, around that time, and some of us are still here realizing that it's a material revolution happening out there, and that it will change how we energize, activate, and construct ideas. So on that note, it's very exciting to have Jenny Sabin here. She is an artist. She graduated with a degree in ceramics from the University of Washington and interdisciplinary visual art, so she's a multitasker, and then went on to become, um, get her Master of Architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. Following that, she was awarded a Pew Fellowship. One of her sub subjects was the digital, a greenhouse digital archive of fossils, and she then was named a U.S. Knight Fellow in Architecture. She received the uh, prestigious Architectural League Prize in 2014, and her work has been exhibited internationally, including at the Frack Center, Cooper Hewitt, Tri Triennial MoMA, and most recently as part of Imprimeur Le Monde at the Pompidou. Recently also she has published a book, Design Research Between Architecture and Biology, co-authored with Peter Lloyd Jones. And she won MoMA and MoMA's PSI Young Architect Program with her submission, LUMA, in 2017. You can see from reading this that um, she is the Arthur L. and Isabel B. Weisenberger Professor in Architecture and Associate Dean for Design at Cornell College of Architecture, Art, and Planning. She is multitasking still as she uh, established and directs the Sabin, or the degree in matter design computation. She directs the Sabin lab at Cornell and the Jenny Sabin studio. So she is mixing many activities and many practices. So we're really looking forward to exploring her fabrication and generative design and her mix of the fields of cell biology, material science, physics, fiber science, fashion, mechanical and structural engineering, pushing the future of architectural practice. So please join me in welcoming Jenny. Great. Thank you, Linda, for that kind uh, introduction. Uh, and thanks to all of you for coming out this, this evening uh, for my talk. It's a sincere pleasure uh, to be here uh, and to be in the city of Chicago. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, three subject areas um, around um, projects and research uh, agendas that have been established in my lab and my practice uh, that look at surface architecture and new paradigms of making. Uh, the, the first topic is looking at adaptive materials. Uh, the second is adaptive structures and looking at part to whole relationships and non-standard material assemblies, uh, primarily um, through the advent of 3D printing and emerging technologies in that area. And then finally, adaptive environments. Uh, and you'll see a lot of crossovers and interrelationships uh, between those, those three. I, I thought I would start with this image, uh, which are, are two drawings by two heroes of mine. Um, the first is a, is a painting by John Piper, this image here, uh, that was a, a front piece for a very important book, a seminal book, uh, titled Organizers and Genes by Conrad Waddington. Uh, he was a pioneer in developmental biology. And he was very interested in looking at the coordinated set of events uh, that were occurring in morphologies. And that's depicted here in this 
and this illustration. Um, so you can see this kind of above ground surface interacting with a network of tensioned um, connections and genes represented as nodes in yet another surface. So here, context is informing code or DNA, and, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the other drawing is by Robert Lericole, uh, who was a structural designer and architect. Uh, he emigrated from Paris and taught in a number of schools in the Northeast and ended up setting up a, a really innovative lab at the University of Pennsylvania in the Department of Architecture and was actively working uh, from the 50s to, to the early 80s. And he was obsessed with looking to nature uh, for uh, information on design and processes and as a way of thinking. And so he would look at these little exoskeletons of these micro scale creatures which are called radiolarian and he was interested in how force was navigating and flowing through materials and geometry uh, and ultimately giving rise to these very interesting and exquisite morphologies. He is the, the father and pioneer of the space frame also corrugated sheet metal and many other structural systems. But the important point is that he didn't start out with any predetermined notion of what those systems would be, but they emerged through a process of interrogation, of looking to nature, extracting principles and rules, and developing analog models to explore uh, those dynamic conditions. So it's the thinking that's represented uh, in these two images uh, that I find really powerful. So we frequently start uh, with very simple parts and rules uh, that through feedback and iteration produce much more complex spatial holes. This interest also probes the productive tinkering and misuse of digital fabrication machines, uh, oftentimes coming from other industries uh, such as six-axis robots uh, coming to us primarily from the automotive industry. Uh, this is my robot Sola, uh, which is housed in my lab at Cornell, as well as digital fabrication processes coming to us from textiles. Now this is also importantly informed by issues of craft and making to produce bio-inspired material systems and software design tools that have the capacity to facilitate embedded expressions in our built environment. We also contribute to core science, uh, operating as designers and architects and artists contributing to problems in science. Uh, one of the things early on that was very important to me and now a longtime collaborator, Peter Lloyd-Jones, was to develop a shared space of trust uh, and to in no way uh, operate as pseudo-designers or pseudo-scientists, but to bring our disciplinary expertise uh, to a shared set of problems uh, to collaboratively work on. Uh, this is a, a cover article that we recently published uh, with a group of uh, biological engineers uh, where we were looking at metabolism and DNA and the promise of pro programmable matter. And we worked on a number of simulation tools to help them and a few other uh, papers that we've contributed to um, and led uh, as well. And I'll come back to to this little guy uh, in a moment uh, from the Polybrick series. So one of the, the fundamental questions that we pose uh, in my lab working on fundamental research, uh, but also in my applied projects and my practice, is how might buildings behave more like organisms responding to and adapting to their built environments? I believe that in the not so distant future, materials, will not just be elements and things in our buildings, but they will generate immersive spaces acting upon and responding to affordances in our built environments. So like the cells in our very own bodies, sensors and imagers will learn and adapt, making materials not only smart, but also aware, sensate, and beautiful. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the the incredible people that I've worked with uh, in the last 15 to 16 years, people who I continue to collaborate with, uh, who have inspired me, uh, who I've learned a great deal from. Uh, this slide is from data and work uh, by 
Dr. Peter Lloyd-Jones. Uh, he is a cell and molecular biologist, and his area of expertise is in extracellular, uh, the, well, his area of expertise is looking at the extracellular matrix, and he's known as a matrix biologist. And these are some of the cardinal features of the ECM, and these data were produced in his lab, where we were looking at how context, right, so the extracellular matrix that these cells are networking within, specifies form, function, structure, program, history, and so on. So the big idea here is that half the secret to life resides outside of the cell. So you have DNA or code, but that DNA is acted upon by external protein and environmental events within this ECM. So this presented to me early on a powerful set of ecological models uh, to bring to architecture, a way of thinking, uh, a way of looking at process and behavior and bringing that analogically uh, into the problems uh, and potentials of architectural application. So as Linda mentioned, we recently published a book uh, titled Lab Studio, uh, which was the name of the hybrid research and design unit that Peter and I co-founded at Penn, uh, where I taught for six years before coming to Cornell. And it's looking at design research between architecture and biology, uh, the methods, the projects that we worked on. Uh, but really, the book explores the collaborative space that we developed. And in looking back, I think that was probably the most important thing uh, that we successfully um, did together uh, in terms of establishing a shared space of trust and working across disciplinary boundaries. And to our knowledge, it was also the first example of that, of, of an architect and a biologist uh, working together in a lab and studio setting uh, with our students. I also work with material scientists, uh, both at Cornell and at other institutions. Uh, this is a slide of Dr. Xu Yang's work. Uh, she, is, um, a, she engages biomimicry in the true definition of the word. Uh, she's interested in looking to nature uh, to extract characteristics, rules, and principles to then design and engineer entirely new materials, right? Uh, so she looks at the feet of gecko, uh, the leaves of lotus plants, uh, to develop superhydrophobic and superhydrophilic materials, so materials that either repel or absorb water. And together, we've been working on the topic of structural color, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment. And more recently, working with Dan Lau, uh, who's based at Cornell. He's a um, an engineer in biological and environmental engineering. And this is the group that um, we collaborated with to produce uh, that cover article that I just mentioned on metabolism. And he's doing an amazing work with 3D printing, 3D printing hydrogels infused with DNA, uh, where we're looking at the promise of programmable matter. So actually designing the material to respond to particular contextual uh, constraints. Uh, so limiting the amount of energy input to get those materials to respond. So over the years, uh, the last 15 plus years, I can't believe it's been that long. Um, time goes by so quickly. Um, we've established a way of working, uh, a, a way of working across disciplinary boundaries. And we typically start by the design and development of tools. I, I like to think of software as a new type of material. Uh, so we write scripts, um, we develop tools to model data, uh, to look at behavior and to, to model that behavior. Uh, we might be looking at a particular material system or a biological data set. And then some of those successful tools are brought into the realm of architectural prototyping. So what I like to call productively contaminating the process with the stuff of making, uh, the constraints of making and fabrication, uh, where we engage 3D printing and robotic fabrication and so on. And that also starts to meaningfully deal with the problem of scale, right? Um, not all of these systems are scalable. Uh, so it's a purposefully slow process uh, to deal with that in a rigorous fashion. And then some of those successful prototypes are brought into the realm of buildings and issues of the built environment and building ecology. 
So the first topic, uh, looking at uh, personalizing architecture, and this very much is wedded to that uh, primary question that I just posed, uh, and also engaging adaptive materials. I'm not going to go in depth into this project. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, we have uh, several papers, technical papers, uh, you can find on my website if you'd like to take a deep dive into this. Uh, but this was our first uh, funded project uh, from the National Science Foundation, which was awarded to us in 2010, a multi-million dollar grant. There were 10 teams across the states that received one of these grants. And for me, uh, having started Lab Studio, uh, working with biologists and materials scientists, getting that grant was a big deal, right? Um, and it was very interesting, all of a sudden, Several of my colleagues who were who were sort of naysayers, kind of saying, you know, why are you working with these biologists? What what a waste of time! Suddenly shifted their opinions. So that institutional stamp coming from the NSF and quite a lot of funding, which is um, the kind of funding that we don't really see in architecture, uh, was was a really important uh, moment in the work. Uh, this was the team. And without going into depth, uh, what we proposed was the development of thin film technology, building skins uh, to be integrated into either existing facade design or new facade, new, new facade design. And the NSF had put out a call for collaborative teams uh, that would engage the problem of, problem of sustainability in buildings, and particularly high-rise buildings but they were really interested in teams that would completely shift our whole approach to the problem. And so I think because we had Lab Studio established and had been working together for a number of years, that was a big reason why we were successful. So we were interested in working with this notion of dynamic reciprocity, which I talked about with the ECM model, uh, looking at how changes in this environment, which is uh, an organic polymer that's been fabricated through photolithography. We were helping to design uh, these uh, substrates. And they were plated with human smooth muscle cells. And we were interested in observing how changes in this environment would alter the behavior of the cell. Now, we were not in any way proposing to put human cells on buildings. That would never work, right? They would quickly die and become confluent. Um, but they were incredibly important at this part of the research, right? And so we extracted rules, principles, characteristics, and observations from this phase to then design sensors and imagers and material protocols uh, that could be scalable. And that's when we started to focus on structural color. And structural color has everything to do with the behavior of light and how that light is interacting with a particular scale of, of texture and geometry in, in a material, uh, usually at a nanoscale. And so here you can see a swath of the e-skin material. Um, it's been fabricated with holes as well as pillars. And what happens when this material is stretched, uh, if there's an array of thousands of these pillars that are normal to the surface, when it's stretched, all of those pillars start to change their orientation and in turn, that changes the way that light is reflecting and refracting with that material. And we then perceive a color change based on what's happening and within the electromagnetic spectrum. So it has nothing to do with pigment. It's all about geometry, texture, material, and our own human perception. So imagine if you could generate a window on demand, right? Imagine if you could personalize your space with these materials. Imagine if the entire facade of a high-rise building would change over time throughout the day uh, to manage the amount of, of UV that's being transmitted and therefore reducing the overall uh, heat gain within the building. We developed a whole series of prototypes looking at that at a kind of prototypical facade scale or as a facade unit. Uh, we had to write all of our own rendering engines to deal with the complexity of the data. We looked at, at the scale of a room and ended up developing this prototype, which took us two years uh, to make, uh, working collaboratively uh, between the lab and the studio, everyone on the team contributing to it, uh, designed and fabricated entirely uh, from scratch. 
And you can see in this video uh, the successful uh, results of that. Uh, this is now part of the permanent collection at the FROC uh, in Orléans, just outside of Paris. So this is our vision. Uh, this is where the work is at now. Um, and it's now ready for, for more funding, um, working with industry partners, ideally, uh, to really move it into potentially a building product. I will say the NSF is really interested in funding, especially within the umbrella that we've been successful in, which is the Emerging Frontiers for Research Innovation. Basically, EFRI is where you get to do weird stuff, right? Weird, amazing stuff. And they're interested in funding concepts at their early stages, uh, but at this point, we're now looking to uh, get funders uh, that will help us move it into, into industry. Related to that work, and more recently, uh, in collaboration with uh, Mariana Bertoni, who's an engineer, uh, her expertise is in uh, photovoltaics, uh, designing with light and energy. Uh, we received a grant uh, to look at sustainable architecture and aesthetics. And the, the meat of this uh, project actually came out of a big argument amongst a bunch of engineers and myself at a symposium where we, we were all giving keynotes. And Mariana and I were aligned and basically everyone else was saying, well, you, you get beauty and good design if there's enough in the budget. And I, I thought, well, wait a minute. Actually, no, that's not the way it goes. And so we have been working on this specifically around PVs and leveraging uh, certain technologies, primarily 3D printing, uh, working with non-standard uh, geometries, and also uh, designing with light, so building upon all of the successes that we developed in eSkin uh, through structural color to establish uh, a material system uh, that is not only very functional and highly performative in terms of solar collection, but also uh, works with light to, to create more phenomenal um, opportunities are for, for human engagement. And so we turn to nature uh, as, a, as a set of muses to begin with, uh, looking at sunflowers and what's called helio heliotropism, so how orientation shifts throughout the day based on the location of the sun, uh, as well as stone plants and their ability to scatter light uh, to optimize for solar conditions, and packing strategies uh, for, those, for those PVs. Uh, these images I've never shown. I probably shouldn't be showing them, but I thought it'd be fun to share. Um, they're sort of hot off the press. Uh, this is the, the current uh, state of this work, uh, and we aim to build this demonstration pavilion, which will have multiple programs. Uh, one, uh, we think it could the system could be an amazing um, opportunity to look at agrivoltaics, uh, which is the integration of uh, PVs with shade-loving plants, uh, as well as a material system that can collect light, uh, store that energy, and then be used uh, to power uh, local sources such as, as your home uh, for light at night. So that work is ongoing, uh, but certainly is the product of about eight years of deep investigation into designing with light uh, to produce optimal conditions that are energy efficient, uh, but also importantly, considering the more phenomenal and aesthetics aspects, aesthetic aspects of that. The next category very much uh, relates uh, to those projects and the, and the core research, uh, but is focused uh, within one material and uh, a series of processes engaging 3D printing uh, but is very much linked to early research with Peter and his team uh, looking at surface design uh, within cellular structures. Uh, I spent a number of years, about eight years, looking at those systems, uh, not to mimic their form, uh, but to really understand their morphology, um, how one cell networks to its neighbor, how they form larger networks to develop surfaces, how those surfaces bifurcate to form organs, and so on. And so in the pursuit of looking at these dynamic uh, multicellular structures and the promise of adaptive structures and part-to-whole relationships, and when I say adaptive structures, I don't necessarily mean literally moving 
uh, but understanding their coordination across a series of parts and how they form holes. We purchased our first 3D printer in 2009 and started to use the printer uh, to rapid prototype uh, data um, and to look at things like you know what would it be like if we if the scientists could hold data Peter and I were really interested in um, the promise of 3d printing to offer other sort of modes and tools uh, to contribute to the scientific process so how might the scientists project into a given problem uh, haptically by looking at their data and so we were developing a whole series of parametric models of these multicellular structures and it was over the course of, of working on some of these projects uh, which were exhibited at Seagraph in, in 2008 and 2009 that I came back to my body literally a body of knowledge around clay and I had thought I had long since left that work behind me um, I was a practicing artist, had a studio in Seattle for a number of years, um, developing ceramic sculpture and painting. Um, but I shifted away from that. Uh, but suddenly, I realized that perhaps that body of knowledge could be applied uh, into a new context. And so what you see here is our powder-based printer. Uh, so it's a, at the time, it featured the largest build bed on the market. And this is still in my lab. It's my still my favorite printer. Um, and so I took out the proprietary media, mixed up a bucket of uh, high fire stoneware, dry, a dry clay body, uh, with a little bit of sugar and maltodextrin, uh, took out the binder and replaced it with alcohol and water. That's why there's a bottle of vodka in my lab. And uh, these were the, the first successful 3D printed greenware parts, which absolutely just blew me away um, in terms of the promise of that. So here's the same part printed in the regular media and here is the part printed in our clay recipe, bisque fired and then glaze fired. So that emerged uh, through active research and now has formed a, a very dedicated trajectory uh, in pedagogy. I've taught a number of seminars on digital ceramics uh, as well as upper level option studios uh, where students work with clay, uh, but in the context of emerging technologies, robotics, uh, 3D printing, uh, to develop screen systems, uh, in some cases load bearing walls, and, and to really interrogate the space of clay, um, but in the context of these new technologies. In my lab, uh, we have been primarily looking at the brick um, the brick hasn't changed a whole lot in many, 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 many years. And that's precisely because of how they're made. Um, that process hasn't really shifted a whole lot. It has been mechanized to a degree. But with 3D printing, there's the opportunity to look at the non-standard, where every single brick can be different. Uh, potentially, you can work with local earth matter, local clay matter. Imagine three having 30 3D printers on a construction site uh, where designing and making is operating in real time. And so Polybrick 1.0 uh, really was sort of working out the constraints of that, um, innovating strategies for connection that could potentially be mortarless. Uh, Polybrick 2.0 um, is looking to nature, in this case looking at human bone formation, and this is actively being worked on in my lab currently. Um, human bone is an incredible model to look at uh, in, the, in terms of optimizing for load conditions, uh, but also in terms of looking at the kind of paradox of building with holes, right? And you find that everywhere in nature. Um, so you have something that's incredibly lightweight, um, yet robust uh, globally. And so we have been working with a mechanical engineer uh, recently, in the last year and a half, Dr. Christopher Hernandez, who, whose expertise is in the me mechanics of bone, uh, to leverage the dynamics of load, right? So imagine a wall where you have the greatest loads at the base uh, being very dense, but then as you um, come upwards to the top of the wall, it can become much more porous and lightweight. Looking at non-standard 
uh, opportunities for bricks. Um, a brick doesn't really need to look like a brick if, if we're working with these types of, of materials and geometric configurations. And like Le Ricolet, uh, looking at, at force as, as a dynamic design parameter, right? How forces are being transmitted through geometry and matter as a design space, as a making space. Uh, and we've taken a deep dive into that, uh, doing CT scans of, of the produced models, um, really looking at uh, details of the material char characteristics, glaze, and, and so on. And so at the end of the semester, and I, I actually just before this um, got off uh, my weekly lab meeting with my team, uh, we'll, we'll be developing the first full-scale prototypical wall of Polybrick 2.0. Polybrick 3.0 um, is, is primarily focused on surface treatment, and uh, this is work in collaboration with Dan Lau, who's the, uh, the engineer, biological engineer, doing amazing things with DNA. And we, to our great surprise, have found that clay is an incredible host to life. And so we have been working on an adaptive glaze uh, that primarily is working with uh, DNA uh, that fluoresces. Uh, so you can pick certain sequences of DNA uh, to get particular results. Um, and so right now we're just controlling the amount of light that's being emitted um, and controlling that uh, through 3D printed substrates, uh, getting it to fluoresce uh, in particular signatures. Uh, but our goal is eventually to not only have it be responsive in terms of light, but to have the DNA interact with particular conditions in a local context where you could um, possibly have a wall that could, could clean the air or at the very least alert people of particular contaminants. And these are some of the uh, more recent results of that. Uh, this work was recently on view as part of an exhibition in Limoges, uh, looking at relationships between nature and ceramics. Uh, so we've been doing micro scale uh, surface texturing uh, with 3D printed porcelain, again to control how that DNA glaze uh, is fluorescing in certain areas. And honestly, for Dan and I, this work has been a lot more successful than we originally thought in the beginning. Um, and what's exciting about this latest work with Polytile is that we're working at scale, right? So these are typical kind of five by five or thereabouts tiles uh, where the, the surface is 3D printed at a micron scale uh, and we're getting these kinds of results um, under UV in this case uh, where you can see the fluorescing of, of the DNA glaze. Developing and, and learning from uh, the su successes of the, the microtexturing, uh, we, we have now started to look at um, the promise of steering uh, and designing with water. Um, so go back to some of the things I talked about with Xu Yang's work uh, where she looks at the, get the feet of gecko uh, to develop materials uh, that are water absorptive or water repellent. And the way that those surfaces work are, have everything to do with the, the surface texture. And so this is 3D printed porcelain. And as you can see, uh, this is vertically orientated at 90 degrees. Uh, we're able to get the water to flow directly to those dimples. And so what I'm interested in is uh, one, uh, being able to direct water uh, to passively cool a wall or two, imagine uh, being able to direct water or collect it uh, for a, a green wall. And this work was recently published um, just about six months ago. So if you're interested in looking at any of these projects um, in depth, uh, you can find our papers on, on my lab website. So I do have a video um, that I'll share with you that captures the polybrick work. Um, this work, uh, started basically in 2013, well really t 2009, uh, but the brick, poly brick work started in uh, 2013 and is ongoing uh, in my lab.
The production of ceramic blocks and tiles has a long technological and design history. Ceramic modules of standard measurement have been used as building block and replacement of stone for many centuries. Ceramic bricks and tiles, so ubiquitous in their application in the built environment, have surprisingly lacked recognition as a viable building component in contemporary architecture practice until now. Polybrick, our latest endeavor under the topic of digital ceramics in the Sabin Design Lab at Cornell University, showcases next steps in the integration of complex phenomena. This work includes advances in digital technology, 3D printing, advanced geometry, and material practices in arts, crafts, and design disciplines. The first phase of the Polybrick series features the use of algorithmic design techniques for the digital fabrication and production of non-standard ceramic brick components for the mortarless assembly and installation of the first fully 3D printed and fired ceramic brick componentry. Polybrick 2.0 is generated with the rules, principles, and behavior of human bone formation. This allows for the production of variegated bricks that are light and porous at the top of the wall and dense at the base to carry load and maintain efficient structural integrity while also amplifying material and formal expressions. Polybrick 3.0 takes our material investigations to the next level. Synthetically designed with advanced bioengineering, these bio bricks will exemplify the cutting edge and future of biologically steered clay and ceramic building blocks in architecture. The two prototypes utilize 3D printed clay, hydrogel, and synthetic DNA. As you can see here, a unique ID stamped with DNA in the form of a C for Cornell is fluorescing within the polybrick clay body. Brick stamping has a long history where variegated size, shape, and stamping indicate place, date of construction, and type, and thus serve as invaluable historical documents. With our unique DNA stamps and glaze, we explore the possibility of live signatures and dynamic surface techniques, coupled with non-standard bricks in the context of living matter and digital ceramics. So that work is ongoing uh, in my lab and somehow I now have an area in my lab that is full of clay and the mess of clay, um, which is just so funny to me, uh, but it's fantastic. I wanted to share one project which is uh, in many ways the most kind of mature and certainly the largest project to come out of this work, a project that I developed in my practice, Jenny Sabin Studio, titled Polymorph, uh, which was part of the Archilab series, um, which was on naturalizing architecture curated by Frederick Migru and Marie-Ange Brer at the FROC in Orléans. If you have not had a chance to visit the FROC, um, the next time you travel to Paris, take the train to Orléans and spend an afternoon. They have the most extensive collection of experimental architecture from the 60s to now in, out of any other institution. So they have all of Archigram's work, Super Studio, um, and they have been incredibly generous uh, collectors um, and have provided a venue for pioneers in digital fabrication and emerging technologies in architecture. This project really started with um, an interest of mine in taking the many years of deep inquiry into cellular processes and their morphologies um, and thinking about how those tools and modes of thinking, bottom-up processes, generative design strategies, uh, could be leveraged and brought into a large uh, scaled spatial prototype. And I had about six months uh, to work on the design for this, developing a whole number of different strategies uh, for materializing a node. What, is, you know, what does that mean? How do you um, create connections across parts? Uh, so in no way mimicking a particular cellular data set, uh, but 
taking all of those learnings uh, and observations and synthesizing that uh, into an analog. And so over the months, uh, we ended up settling on three different uh, components uh, that have about 253 different ways of interweaving uh, to develop a thick uh, surface, a uh, thick surface design. And the background organization is quite simple. Um, an equilateral triangle, you can see here, and an isosceles. Uh, so as long as all of the arms connect, uh, you can have multiple ways of, of interweaving. In this project, I didn't directly print the parts, um, but instead leveraged the 3D printer to optimize for mold design. Uh, for any of you that have done slip casting, it's very difficult to produce a simple two-part mold if the part has undercuts or complex curvature. And so with actually some very simple algorithms, uh, we optimized for that. Uh, 3D printed positives um, of each part and then made about 20 plaster uh, slip, cap, slip casting molds uh, for those parts uh, so that we could cast about 90 parts a day. Um, slip casting was also very important in terms of the structural system. Uh, so this is a high fire stoneware and running internally uh, through all of these components, and this is why slip casting was important because it produces a hollow part, is a continuous network of uh, tensioned stainless steel cable. And I'll let you guys kind of think on how we actually threaded each of these. Um, there were some tricks up our sleeves that were very, very important. Uh, so you can see here during the installation phase, um, the curvature that's starting to take shape so that the entire uh, thing is rigid. Uh, so all of the ceramics is brought into compression. There's about 2,200 uh, digitally produced and hand cast ceramic uh, parts uh, shipped from my studio at the time in Philadelphia uh, to Orléans. And we actually only broke one part throughout the whole process. And that was because one of our wonderful interns who was helping with installation actually just accidentally knocked one off a table. So that was to my great relief. It's now permanently installed here in one of uh, what's called the turbulence. And this is the addition to uh, the frock uh, by Jacob and McFarlane. And you can see in this image some of the lacy calcified woven cellular conditions starting to emerge um, and the final uh, prototype, which has a diameter of about uh, 22 feet. Um, its topology uh, is fairly complex. Uh, there are three hole holes uh, within the overall form. And it weighs about uh, 2,000 pounds, is suspended uh, from this atrium area, and you can see the stainless steel uh, cable exiting strategically at certain moments uh, to attach uh, to the scaffolding of the building. I will never ever do a project like this again, um, but it was a tremendous learning experience and uh, those learnings have since been brought into, into other research and, and projects. So I'm going to transition and conclude with the third topic, uh, which is on adaptive environments, uh, which also really showcases work uh, that's operating at a much larger scale, uh, operating within the built environment uh, with diverse publics, and primarily uh, wor is work that delves into fabrication processes emanating from textiles, um, uh, the art of textiles and the design of textiles, um, both weaving uh, but primarily uh, knitting. This, this work started uh, with a commission uh, from 2012 that came to me from Nike, and they were about to launch a new technology, which is very familiar to all of you now, called FlyKnit. And they invited uh, six artists and designers from around the world uh, to kind of riff and be inspired by the core benefits of FlyKnit. Uh, they called us the FlyKnit Collective. And those benefits included performance, lightweight, form-fitting, um, sustainability, and, and so on. And I was very interested in developing a project which ended up being a pavilion. Uh, my city was in New York 
was New York City, and the pavilion was sited in, in New York uh, for about five months. And so I was interested in developing a project uh, that would work with knitting processes. I, I thought it was kind of obvious, given that it was fly knit. Um, and at that point, I had done quite a bit of work with, with weaving and digitized jacquard weaving, uh, but I had not done very much with knitting. And I was interested in how those processes would interact and intersect with human uh, bio data sets. So thinking about the generative potential of data, the hidden structures, the intangible nature of data, and how that could be revealed uh, through an alternate material system. So not a mapping or a representation, uh, but the tools literally attached uh, data points uh, from 30 uh, data sets that were collected uh, from people outfitted with sensors. We had them engage in all kinds of activities through workshops out in the city. And that data was linked uh, with parameters of knitting. Uh, I spent some time collaborating with a textile designer, Anne Emling, whose expertise is in knitting, uh, to wrap my head around what we could do. And it was also the first time that I struck up uh, a wonderful, now wonderful multi-year collaboration with Shima Siki. And Shima Siki is at the forefront of what's called whole garment knitting. Uh, so that's 3D seamless knitting. In many ways, you can kind of draw connections between 3D printing and knitting uh, in terms of knitting being one of the, the first examples of 3D printing, additively layering link by link, row by row material. And they certainly had never done anything at this scale before. And I, I said to them, I said, look, OK, the, the geometric components, the topology, it's basically cones, cones and cells. So imagine a glove, but much bigger, right? Um, and so we worked together to uh, interface their CAD CAM uh, te technology in terms of fabrication to really push boundaries. That work then uh, was was further refined uh, through other projects, um, one coming from the Cooper Hewitt as part of their uh, design triennial, uh, which the one that I took part in was on beauty. And they commissioned me to produce a pavilion. I should also mention, in this project, it was the first time that I started to work with high-tech responsive fibers. Uh, so building upon the learnings and knowledge uh, from eSkin, and designing with light and structural color, but now looking at it, um, those properties within thread material. And with the Cooper Hewitt, um, and I just wanted to kind of point out some of the, the benchmarks and highlights of a whole series of projects that I think really helped me win um, MoMA and MoMA PS1 Young Architects Program. But here I started working with Arup Engineering, uh, taking a deep dive into understanding um, what was happening within the net structures, looking at uh, the tension systems, how uh, tension was flowing through these uh, material assemblies, how alterations in the knit parameters would impact things. So one little side note, we learned that a high density of holes actually stiffened the fabric uh, because sort of counterintuitively, you wouldn't think that, but what it does is that it creates a whole series of knots so it actually works really effectively to stiffen uh, areas of the fabric. So we took all of that data and brought it back to our simulation tools, our generative tool tools. None of this work would be possible without the computer, right? And all of my work, um, there's a lot of innovation around parametric design, computational design, and digital fabrication. But equally important, none of this work would be possible without the analog and the human hand and the kind of meticulous, slow parts of the projects um, that are very much, um, you know, at root. So in this, this project, uh, this was for the Cooper Hewitt, uh, featured an active bending system. Uh, we also started to look at a double surface, uh, which was pretty complex, um, where structurally each of these cones act like a spring, right? And so you can see the photoluminescent fibers uh, releasing light. Uh, there's also solar active fibers that change color uh, in, um, in the presence of either the sun or a UV source. And some images uh, from that, that final opening. So 
when I learned that I was a finalist uh, for MoMA and MoMA PS1's YAP program, I felt confident that, or I knew strategically if we were going to win, I needed to incorporate a material system and a way of thinking um, in design around that that had reached a certain maturation. And so from 2012 until roughly 2016, through those projects, I felt pretty confident that we were ready to, to take it to an altogether different scale uh, and also to take it outside. And so for those of you that are not familiar with the Young Architects program, it's one of the most important uh, competitions for emerging architects. And uh, the project becomes a, uh, an environment, a backdrop for programs that take place at PS1 in Long Island City. Uh, it's especially an important project for what's called Warm Up, uh, which happens every Saturday. They bring in incredible DJs and artists uh, to perform. And the brief uh, to the architects that make the finalist list, and it's a kind of multi-phased competition. Uh, there's usually five architects or, or teams that are selected for the finalist list, um, is to develop a project that um, engages the diverse programs that MoMA PS1 offers, as I mentioned, uh, has some aspect of, of sustainability uh, and recycling built into it. Uh, it has to provide seating. Uh, these were the spool stools that we innovated and the prototypes we wove with my robot. Um, this is Sola in my lab. And unique to the, the year for that brief, um, the curators were interested in projects that would engage aspects of materiality and transformation, which obviously were, you know, those terms really resonated uh, for me. And so Lumen, uh, one of the m most important parts of, of the proposal and, and what ended up being built uh, was for the project to operate as an environment. Um, I was really interested in how people would take ownership of it, uh, that it would transform and offer different types of experiences, whether you visited during the day or during uh, the night. And so the, the program for the project uh, also fed into that. Uh, we worked with the local context. Uh, so if you're familiar with PS1, this is where you enter. This is the large courtyard and the smaller courtyard. Uh, we took it all on. Um, so the canopy structures uh, stitch into the existing concrete walls. Uh, there are three 42-foot-plus uh, tensegrity towers, which add a kind of third envelope of dynamic conditions to the project. Uh, so the entire project is meant to be adaptive. It, it sways and, and moves with, with the wind, sort of taking flutter. Uh, the, solar active and responsive uh, fibers, uh, which also include photoluminescent fibers, absorb UV from the sun during the day, and then emit light at night, which is further uh, accented by uh, a lighting treatment. And there was a sort of magic moment right at dusk uh, where all of the photoluminescent fibers that had um, absorbed UV energy throughout the day would, the the photons would get excited and then suddenly everything was glowing. It was, it was, it was pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, and these, you can see this is a detail of the solar active fibers. So they would change color, kind of these subtle yellows, pinks, and blues. Uh, this is the sewing diagram. So this is part of the process that is incredibly laborious and slow. Uh, I've been working with uh, Daisy and Fabrics, and more recently Rainier Industries, who does the sewing and the finishing. So every single element, uh, the cells and the cone members, are individually digitally fabricated. They each have a unique ID that we carefully coordinate from the very beginning of the design stage to the final uh, produced fabric structure. And they work one to, at one-to-one -one scale. So we literally plot a drawing that is the size of the courtyard. So this is about 150 feet long and about um, 82 feet in, in width. So they, they said to me, you know, we started in the Northwest and we ended in New York City. <laughs> um, so detail looking at how that the canopies stitch into uh, the existing walls 
again, the solar active fibers. Uh, there was a misting system. So one of the bullet points on the brief is to, to have some water feature. And so there was an integrated misting system uh, that was a network that ran on top of the canopy within the webbing of, of the cells. And uh, we embedded a couple of IR sensors, uh, which were fairly simple. And basically what would happen is when you would pass by one of these sensors, they'd flip the solenoid valve in the misting system, which would just change the differential pressure of, of the water. And so you get this kind of breathing, hissing uh, sound. And, and it actually worked quite well to cool down the local uh, micro, you know, climate beneath the canopy structure. So here's a view at night. Uh, the smaller courtyard, which was one of my favorite parts of the project, um, just in terms of its kind of intimacy, a view of the Tensegrity Tower. Uh, so these are diagrid structures with a flying ring, a compressive mast, and they're strategically placed to lift up the canopy structures, uh, but again, to offer yet another level of, of dynamics uh, into the overall uh, flow of forces across the fabric structures. I'll just say there was some creative rigging that took place after 9 p.m. Um, to get these these guys up, um, but it was it was pretty exciting. They were engineered to take these types of loads. Uh, people were not supposed to climb them, but of course they they did. Um, and you know, for me, the best part of the project was was watching people engage with it, and and again to kind of really take ownership of it and to use it and to make it their environment. I found warm-up to be very scary uh, when 7,000 people would frequent uh, the project, um, but Lumen held up and did quite well over the course of the summer, and portions of it have traveled to other installations and, and exhibitions. That project um, was was well loved. Uh, to my great surprise, it was in the top 10 for most Instagrammed projects around the world, which blew me away. It's like, yay, Instagrammers. Um, but people just fell in love with it, and it takes, it's very photogenic. Uh, but what came out of that was a, a lot of interest, um, and it really was a boost for my, my practice, and has since uh, contributed to commissions that for permanent projects. I'm going into construction uh, for a project in Abu Dhabi, which is a public pro project on a beach as a part of a park, and um, some other projects, and, and most recently, and this is the last project that I'll share, um, a project for Microsoft Research uh, as part of their Artist in Residence program, a project called Ada, uh, which to our knowledge uh, is the first architectural pavilion uh, to be driven by humans but powered by artificial intelligence and i'll i'll play a little video uh, to kick it off and then conclude with some details ada is driven by artificial intelligence it's a project that smiles back at you comes from Ada Loveless, one of the first computer programmers, and the linkages between weaving and computation. Knitting is, is one of the earliest examples of 3D printing, additively layering link-by-link, row-by-row material. The project features soft forms that are more feminine versus masculine, and that's a paradigm shift in architecture. The shape of Ada is an ellipsoid. It features a unique exoskeleton composed of a network of fiberglass rods and 3D printed nodes. Every single node is different and has a unique ID attached to it. The interior surface is composed of hundreds of digitally knit cones and cells in a network of webbing. In the center of Ada is a large tensegrity cone composed of a skin 
of fiber optic cables. Photoluminescent fiber absorbs energy from the lighting and then emits that back as knitted light, as glowing light. But the real magic comes through how people actually engage with it. On the interior soft surface is a whole network of LEDs connected to a network of cameras within the atrium, reading the facial expressions of people in an anonymous way. When Building 99 is very active, the project will be very vibrant and highly transformative. There are moments where it blushes. The hope is that people realize their engagement is actually driving the project. That the project begins to gain its own life in the way that it is interacting with people. So in collaboration with Microsoft Research, um, some of the early conversations that took place, and this was a, an 18-month-long um, project and inquiry, we were interested in, in the potential of a project that would integrate and negotiate artificial intelligence as a, as a technology, as a platform, um, but to fundamentally make um, the project human, uh, to bring, bring those kind of topics back to, to something that was, was human-centered. We were also interested in how the project could provoke and inspire uh, conversation around some of the more uh, pressing and ethical concerns around AI and privacy and data collection, personal data collection, um, by becoming an interface uh, for that. Um, it's also a, a platform for research, uh, so other researchers at Microsoft Research uh, can plug into uh, the project with their data. Uh, these drawings highlight some of the details of the system. Uh, this was a big leap for us uh, in terms of how the structure is working, um, the negotiation of the two surfaces. So I think you can see what we've been building upon since the Cooper Hewitt project with the, with the two surfaces, but this really dialed it in. Uh, this is a view uh, through that double membrane. So on the exterior is an exoskeleton of the 3D printed nylon nodes, which is in continuous com compression. And that operates reciprocally uh, with uh, the knitted um, fabric structure, uh, which is operating in, in tension. Uh, this diagram highlights the pipeline for the software. Uh, we developed all of the software basically that interfaced uh, with the live feed of data uh, from Microsoft's end, uh, and then that transferred into the three-tiered lighting system. And so there are three scales of lighting. Uh, one, the LEDs uh, that operate more individually in terms of accessing data from the network of cameras uh, based on individual engagement. And then the PAR lights were external to, or are, uh, the project is up and active. You can, you can visit uh, by appointment if you're interested. Um, it's sited in, in Building 9 at Microsoft um, uh, on their campus in Redmond, Washington. And so the PAR lights would register the collective sem sentiment of, of the building at any given time. And then we translated that into a whole series of parameters based on sentiment. Um, these are all changeable, um, and they changed quite a lot throughout the course of, of the design process. And one of the kind of amazing parts of developing this was working with an incredible team at Microsoft Research, and specifically Daniel McDuff, uh, who is the person developing the machine algorithms and AI uh, to detect um, sentiment and facial patterns, and his research is focused on uh, not just the development of the tools, but he's, he's fundamentally looking at how our environment affects well-being and emotion, and so, um, and he's working on tools that can be used in, say, hospitals or other types of si situations where the monitoring of one's health and wellness uh, can be incredibly important in terms of need and understanding what those nuances are. Um, so Ada also you know, celebrates that as, as a materialization of data and offers a kind of 
another space for interpretation. This is a, a detail of the, the fiber optic interior sleeve, um, and this was a, a new leap for us, a very exciting one in terms of getting much more refined with the programming of individual threads. And this is a, a camera that's on the interior of Ada. Uh, there's a whole network of cameras around uh, the building, uh, but this one, you, if you're interacting with this one on the inside of the project, you can actually override all of those. Um, and so they, the, uh, the op at the opening for the project, uh, you'll see a few images in just a moment, um, it was pretty amazing to see people start to figure out what they could do with the project. Um, here you can see some of the details. Uh, this project was so hard to put together. It was so hard to install because the precision of how the structure works um, was such that it almost made it humanly impossible to physically put together. So, for example, the compressive exoskeleton, it's great when it's in full compression, but as you're putting it together, right, it's all over the place. Um, so because everything wants to work together, the process of getting that just right um, was, was a learning lesson. Um, so here are some images of the opening night. Uh, these people, this group is beneath that central ca camera, uh, and so they figured out if they were all smiling really big, they could change all of the, the lighting conditions and therefore get uh, different uh, results and how the materials are responding. I should mention that um, one, one of the important parts of the project in, in comparison to other people's work that are at the forefront of AI, such as Mark uh, Sager, who um, he's based in Auckland in New Zealand, and he has a project called Baby X. And in his work, he's, he's seeking to humanize AI uh, through what he, he s states are more symbiotic relationships between humans and machines. Um, but in contrast to that work, Ada doesn't appear lifelike, right? Instead, Ada offers subtle and more abstract interactions with humans uh, through space, material, and form uh, to augment and expand our emotional range in a specific context, and in this case, uh, an office environment. Um, which in turn affects the probable sentiment data being collected as, as actual new information. Um, and so that, that engagement with people and the kind of extension of one's um, emotional range is, is of great interest to me and in, in how that um, can be pushed forward in the context of architecture and personalizing spaces. And these are some final images uh, and this beneath the interior um, looking up through the the ten, ten segregate structure so I'll just conclude uh, with a few slides uh, I've I've shown you a number of our research projects in the lab the Sabin lab at Cornell and as well as my practice Jenny Sabin studio uh, they're two separate entities uh, oftentimes um, integrated but two separate teams um, but there's a lot I haven't shared. If you're interested in seeing more, this is where you can find us. Uh, we've been very fortunate to receive quite a lot of funding over the years uh, through a lot of sweat and hard work, uh, learning a lot from my s scientific collaborators around you know, what it takes uh, to uh, secure an NSF grant. One thing I've learned, um, just as a side note, is that you don't get NSF funding without prior NSF funding. So you're like, what the heck? How do you get NSF funding? Well, you align yourself with, with co-PIs and PIs that, that have had successes in the past, and you, you build up your repu reputation, um, which is important to the NSF to, to have, you know, that you have a certain number of years of work uh, and recognition. And I will say, as co-chair of Fabricate, uh, which we hope we hope will take place. Uh, we've been working on it for two years. Um, it's due to launch on the 2nd and 4th of April in London, uh, and the title of the conference is Making Resilient Architecture. Uh, if we are not able to physically launch the conference uh, due to what's going on around the world with COVID-19, um, we will have a very strong online presence. Um, so if you're interested in looking at the best 
and most cutting edge work in digital fabrication and making and craft in architecture, engineering, and beyond. Um, join us, um, and this is, you can come to the Web Fabricate uh, website. Jane Burry, who's based uh, in Swinburne, she's the dean there, and myself are the co-chairs uh, for this installment of Fabricate. And it's the first time that two women have led this, which is pretty exciting. And then lastly, if you're interested in graduate programs uh, and uh, or doing another graduate degree, um, this is a new program that I launched uh, three years ago, uh, formally, four years ago, uh, informally. And it's an MS in matter design computation. Uh, and we purposefully do not require a prior professional degree in architecture with the interest in bringing students in uh, from, from other disciplines as, as well. Um, so with that, I will conclude and we have some time for some questions. Thanks so much for uh, staying and for coming out tonight. We have, we have microphones for you. Oh, goodness. OK. Um, OK, so this is over my head, but I'm going to try to ask this question anyway. Um, I did a project where I was like really interested in bioluminescent lighting, and you're fluorescing DNA. Is that from, are you manipulating bioluminescent um, ant plants and animals, like what they do? Or is that coming, because you mentioned the photoluminescence a lot, but not bioluminescence. Yeah, I have not worked with bioluminescence. The The DNA work is a little bit different. Okay. Um, so you could, I mean, there there are relationships in terms of the types of DNA that those little creatures have that you're working with, but I... I haven't worked directly with bioluminescence in that case. Okay, I wasn't sure if it was the same like when you said DNA, so I just yeah wanted to ask. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, it is it is a bit different. Um, literally, I mean, it's hilarious. Dan and I have so much fun. There's a DNA store, right? Like an on online DNA store. There's many of them, and uh, and you can you can select sequences like chunks of of DNA code that will, you know produce that type of light. And so I would imagine, I haven't looked at this, um, that there are probably similarities between that type of DNA and what's happening with the bioluminescent um, creatures that you're, you're talking about. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Don't be shy. <laughs> Hi, I am not an architect, and I didn't even play one on television, but um, so this question may be open-ended, but is it, do you have a holy grail project, something you, you know, that you'd love to figure out, but you just haven't gotten there yet? I'm so impressed with the amazing thought processes mm. you know, that have gotten you here but is there somewhere you want to go yet yeah the so I've always been interested in how the work will impact the built environment and operate at, at an architectural um, scale and um, I mean I, I'm very comfortable with with experimentation and ambiguity and and I think the success of the work is also the not knowing exactly where, you know, what it will become in the end. But yeah, the whole, whole Holy Grail project is is realizing this in a park setting, uh, as a building skin, um, as a facade. Uh, you know, the, the platform for Ada could be a building facade, and I had some preliminary conversations um, around that with with, uh, which I probably shouldn't say, but with certain people um, th that I've worked with around how that could happen. And so the project in Abu Dhabi is so exciting on that, on that end, um, which will be permanent. It's outdoors. I can't show it, but it builds on this work. And, and the yarns in that project, we spent about 
14 months doing R&D uh, with a company that is very well regarded because there wasn't a PTFE material that exhibits photoluminescent properties. And so we were able to take a deep dive into designing and engineering that. And PTFE is, is really the only type of yarn material you can have in an extreme climate like, like Abu Dhabi. So I'm excited about that. And, and during Lumen, a lot of the visitors and participants and so on would tell me that they, they visited frequently. They would come and have their lunch every week there if they lived in Long Island City, that they wished it was in their child's school, they wished that it was in their local park, they wished that it was in a, in a hospital. That was one comment that I was really intrigued by. So there, that resonance that people have with the work is, I want to see that, you know, out in our cities and in our spaces. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, back here. For uh, Polybrick 2, I believe, 2.0, um, are there boundaries in how it would interact with water? Like, for example, as like a seawall or a coastal barrier? Um, I know like on the other side of the lake, for example, in Michigan, um, we're experiencing levels of erosion and how places that are sitting next to the lakefront and how mm -hmm. the, the water is interacting with those places. So from like an architectural standpoint, you gotta like rethink how everything is sitting and like how high things are sitting. And the right. uh, lake is really weird because it comes in and then it comes out. So um, have you like, ha where are there like a lot of boundaries and how like water can move through that specifically? Uh, if it's something like a fluctu fluctuating water tide or sea level? Yeah, no, I, I love it. It's, Great set of comments. Um, no, we have not looked at the promise of Polybrick 2.0 acting as a as an interface for a barrier. There, there is interesting work in that realm. So, good friend and colleague, uh, well, both both of them, Ron Rael and Virginia Sanfrontello, uh, they're based in the Bay Area. They started Emerging Objects. Um, some of you are probably very familiar with their work. But one research project that they're working on is 3D printed components that are inspired by uh, coral, like coral reef um, characteristics. And so they're actually using, they're putting those with a team back into the water to help um, you know, these reef systems that are deteriorating. And so the the texturing and the non-standard aspects of those 3D printed components are contributing in seawater to, um, you know, hopefully helping these ecosystems uh, come back and, and thrive a bit better. Um, but it's a, that's a great suggestion. I, you know, the porous nature of the bricks could, could have other programs and functions for sure. I love the Polybrick 1.0 and Polybrick 2.0 um, ideas. My question is, have you seen them be implemented in a larger scale project like a building or a house or has anybody drawn from those ideas? I love the, uh, that you drew from the human bone. I was wondering if anybody had like implemented that into like a building or anything like that. Not yet. Um, I think I mentioned that we're working on our first prototypical wall um, this, this semester or actually all last for the last year. Um, so that'll be the kind of first test. Um, it, it's also meant that we've needed to innovate the fabrication processes in terms of printing um, with the scale leap. Uh, so we've developed a, a new indefector on my robot, um, a whole series of sensors that interface the controller so that we can kind of tune and adjust that. So, so there are constraints to to build in when, when scaling. So we're working on that now. Uh, my next step is, is to reach out to people like Boston Valley Terracotta. Um, they're an you know, amazing uh, ceramics, industrial ceramics, architectural ceramics company um, that has done a lot uh, on Louis Sullivan's um, buildings in terms of repair and restoration. Uh, but that's the type of partner I'd like to work with to then start to realize how they would operate in a building, for example. So we haven't yet, but we're that's the that's the goal. <laughs> yeah. 
the other issue is, you know, there are a whole slew of other issues that oftentimes you don't think about, but code contractors that are even willing to consider working with materials, um, litigious issues. So it, those, those are hurdles that are also things you have to surpass. I have a question about the yarn that you're using and the kind of longevity of that under like the conditions of it being sort of like knit and stretched. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I guess exposed to the outdoors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the the yarns in so Lumen Lumen did well. It wasn't designed and engineered to be permanent um, by any means. Uh, the, the yarns are synthetic, so and that's by design, especially for Lumen, we couldn't work with, say, a cotton or a wool that it wouldn't do well in the elements. Um, and so they're quite resilient in terms of negotiating rain and, and extreme sunlight. There is a lifespan to the photoluminescent responsivity, uh, and I haven't yet you know, experienced uh, that diminishing, but I we do know the extent of, of that. But with this new project that I mentioned that I, I'm not able to share just yet, the PTFE material um, has a, a much longer lifespan and is durable and can be outdoors and, and permanent um, up to a, around 15 years and then would need to, you know, be replaced, which is, which is pretty typical for a fabric structure. Um, and then if it's coated with something, then it would have an even longer lifespan. So that's been an exciting leap for me uh, with just thinking about durability and, and extreme climates and how the yarns will behave. I'm just curious uh, what uh, your approach or stance is around like intellectual property since you're doing so much research-based work? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of IP, uh, well, I could approach that a number of different ways. Um, anything I do at Cornell is Cornell's at the end of the day. So it's kind of simple, right? Um, but, you know, if we were to to go after a patent for eSkin and, and uh, maybe even a startup company spins out of that, uh, then there's, there's a pretty clear path to go down with Cornell on how that's done. Um, and in that case, that would also be with Penn, with, with Penn because they're, they're PIs that are from Penn as well. Um, and it becomes shared IP. So that, that there's a clear process for that. Uh, and a rigorous one um, as well. Um, I've, I've learned over the years, you also have to be careful with what you share publicly. Like, so if there's something we're working on in the lab um, that hasn't been published yet um, and we think maybe is patentable, if I were to share an image of that in any kind of public context, it immediately voids its potential to be patentable. Right, so, so those are things you, you learn along the way. Um, we publish, and so once something is published, then it's out there, and, and you know, we, in the lab, we write technical papers, uh, so they're, they're papers that are meant to go out into the world for people to read and to, to use and to build upon, so contributing to, to core knowledge. Um, and I, for, for the research, I've adopted, uh, the scientific model for how um, credit is given. So my students are lead authors and I'm the senior author. So in the sciences, I mean, that's how they've done it for a long time. I think it's a great model. So usually look at the first author and the last author. So the first author is the, you know, the student on the ground, like really pushing stuff. And then the senior author is like, you know, the, it's the, their lab, the vision, the all the, the kind of work and foundation for it. Um, so I have, undergraduates leaving with two, three peer-reviewed papers under their belts in some cases, which is, which is not common. Um, 
in my practice, it's different. Uh, it's that's my baby, and that, you know, we're, we're that's where we're really pushing at a refined level um, application. And but I'm very careful in terms of transparency and how 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 things are funded. And so yeah, it's nuanced. Yeah, but it's a it's a really interesting question. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I'm curious about you know slow um, impact of forces you know that on the context or on the structure, as opposed to things that are very rapidly changing. Mm. So you know kind of sm even slow failure as opposed to quick failure. How do th how do those two conditions um, interact productively? Um, I've experienced both. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, we, we consider, well, maybe I'll start one of my, well, I mentioned some of the work of Robert Laricole. One of the things that he was obsessed with was what he called beauty and failure and um, how the order of construction follows the order of deconstruction or failure. And so he was obsessed with, you know, finding those perfect sinusoidal deformations uh, in in structures, so he could then incorporate that as a as a logic, as a construction logic. Um, so given that, especially the, the the fabric structures and projects, they're so dynamic, um, and knitting is so no no matter how precise you are with the modeling and the design work it's it's very unpredictable um but the maybe i'll just go to one detail actually i'll just go here the primary tension forces are taken through the webbing and so this detail i'm so proud of it we've refined to a really like intense degree um so the primary tension forces are taken through this and so not a whole lot is taken through through the knitting itself um, but we do design for, for creep. So my structural engineer, um, Clayton Binkley, uh, who was with Arup for 10 years, and he just recently started his own practice. Uh, we've worked together now for about four and a half years. And, and it's just, it's so much fun, you know, to collaborate. And so we, we do think about that slow creep that happens with, with fabric. And there are certain fabrics that are better at negotiating that over others. Um, but then another great kind of example of the fast failure, we had, we had to do so much R&D on these nodes because there's some significant bending forces being taken at those nodes, especially at those more extreme points of curvature. And so which, you know, the question of which process, which material, you know, is it even possible? Um, and we, yeah, we experienced some very fast failure <laughs> with, with these, you know, basically exploding. Um, but these were perfect. And so they're, they're nylon uh, and it's uh, FDM printing, uh, way too expensive, but it was a great experience, uh, experiment for this. So, yeah. Got one there. Yeah. So, I don't know if it's the right question, um, but Brick 2.0 is, um, the concept is, of it is very interesting. And I was just thinking that um, the concept of that brick and the concept of um, compressed, um, stabilized um, earth brick could be combined. Um, can it be combined? So, if I understand your question correctly, are, are you asking if this, if this can operate as 
as a brick or are you th- are you thinking more like a um, hybrid that so it's a type of brick right um you are planning to like use yeah use it to yeah, yeah. absolutely so um are you aware of um compressed stabilized earth bricks yes yeah yeah, yeah. so um my question is can the concept of that and the concept of this combine and make a kind of brick that can resist um, a place's um, weather conditions or erosion or water resistance for that matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he was talking about, um, there was a guy who talked about yep. how can it resist water or whatever that he asked. Yeah, no, so I, I, I love these suggestions. Um, We haven't taken it to earth matter yet. Uh, it, that would be, in terms of the printing process, that would be pretty tough. Um, but we are moving away from, so all of these, especially these latest studies here, um, these are all porcelain, uh, and which behaves in a, you know, a very particular way. These are some of the CT scans of the, the Polybrick uh, 2.0. But we're now in in pursuit of the wall, uh, jumping scale and working with the robot uh, for the deposition of clay. And in that case, the the clay is it's much cruder, right? Um, in terms of the bead of material that's being deposited. And so one of the things which is related to your question that I'm excited about is once we we nail this and we we figure out the scale leap, um, there's a potential to work with local earth, right? So you you could work with earth matter that then um, is printed on site and and um, works well under compression. Yeah, I mean, which is a bit different from the rammed earth bricks that you're talking about. Yeah, but I think the the relationship could be in working with earth, right, and clay, and mud. And yeah, stuff I mean, like that. I think that's what they're trying to use on Mars to build things there, and like trying to do it which will like reduce pollution yeah. that we are creating like there will be pollution because of these two right with it what type of pollution um i don't know like normal bricks create a lot of um i don't know the air like when the air interacts with the material mm. that's the kind of uh, molecules it creates which creates pollution I don't know if I'm explaining it to you right. But well, I, I think, you know, f- from the beginning, I there's been a, a deep interest in, um, one, you know, using the 3D printer not just as a specialized tool in a lab, that, but that, that actually we could imagine having robots and 3D printers on a construction site where you're working with local earth matter and therefore operating in a more sustainable and local way. Um, I ran a studio that was, this was a few years ago now, um, looking at disaster relief shelters yeah. and rapid erection of, of relief shelters and working with local materials makes a lot of sense in that context. And so we were bringing cutting edge technology to that and, and 3D printing and kind of op- opening up possibilities, which the head f- for disaster relief um, at Red Cross who, who was collaborating with us was incredibly excited excited about it and he also said you know this is how we think we think in a bottom-up way we actually don't ship materials around we actually work um, in a resilient fashion with local materials so that I think could be really cool is if we we had these machines and robots on site we'll get there (laughs) yeah it's a great question thank you Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much.